actually hear any of that from Mr. Ball, so that's not their portrayal. Uh, I heard some testimony from Ms. Lewis about how she feels about it. Uh, again, I don't think that constitutes a portrayal. Um, I think, do you have, let me put it this way. I believe that Mr. Bankson is correct in how he describes the rule of optional completeness. Do you have an argument to make for why whatever portion of this video you think needs to be played is required for the jury to not be confused by the portion they heard um, earlier today? It's the argument I already made. Okay. And Your Honor, I would just reply to that, that the idea that he's saying that they're not, like he wants to play it so he can show that Mr. Jones believes that they're real, literally said that in the video that we just played. So so sure. Mr. Right, I, I did hear that as well. Um, also, the claim that he's been sitting next to them all week, I heard that also. Um, I have a hard time imagining, and I have not watched it, um, that any clip that includes a conversation about what's happening in court this week can be in any way helpful to the jury in their job. Um, I've certainly, can you please sit down, Mr. Jones? It is not your turn to talk. I will happily allow Mr. Reynal a minute to hear all of your suggestions uh, if you and he think that is necessary, but you have to wait. Um, I haven't watched any of it, so I don't know what it says. If you want to send it to me and have me watch it um, on a break, I will do that. But. Um, there are a number of people who have been writing to me and telling me what Mr. Jones is saying every day. I don't know if they're accurate or not in their descriptions. I'm not otherwise going to find out. So I will only see this if you send it to me and ask me to look at it. Would you like to confer with your client? I think he wants you to say something else. We'd simply re-urge that uh, it's confusing for the jury because the clip leaves out the part where Mr. Jones says that he certainly believes that Ms. Lewis is real. All right, so if you want to send me that part, that may in fact meet the requirements of uh, the rule of optional completeness and uh, send it to my uh, staff attorney and she'll review it and then I'll review it on a break and I'll let you know. Thank you. Anything else before we bring the jury back? No, you're not. Anything from your side? All right. We're ready to have the jury back. I'll be seated. Mr. Reynal, do you have a witness for the jury? I do. The defense would call Alex E. Jones. All right, Mr. Jones, come stand in front of me, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Come have a seat. Um, in the witness chair, there is water and glasses. You have pretty good volume. I don't think you'll need to lean into the microphone. I see that you have a document with you. I don't know if you were here when I explained to a prior witness who brought documents with them that you can't look at any document for any reason while you're testifying until and unless one of the lawyers or myself instructs you to do so. So I'm going to ask you to actually just give it back to Mr. Raynal until he may think you need it, okay? Okay. Did you understand all that? I did, yes. Okay. While you testify, it is not a conversation. It is a question and answer. So the instructions are to let the lawyers completely finish asking their questions before you begin your answer. To listen to the question and answer what is asked. So you can't always say that you don't know or you don't understand if those things are true. To answer out loud in words and not head shakes and the like. Um, I think that, that's all my instructions. I say it so many times, sometimes I forget one thing, but I think those are all, do you understand them? I do. All right, you may begin, Mr. Raynal. Alex, would you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Hi, I'm Alex Jones. How are you feeling today, Alex? I actually feel good because I get a chance to, for the first time, say what's really going on instead of the corporate media and high-powered law firms manipulating what I actually did. I want to um, start by kind of letting the jury know a little bit about your youth and where you grew up so they can get to know you better. Is that okay? Okay. And, and you know, before we do that, I just do want to say this on record because I've said it many times. I apologize to both. Uh, sustained. So, Mr. Jones, one of the instructions I just gave you is that this is not a conversation. Question and answer. So she got the monologue, but not me. I got it. And so you have to only answer questions that are asked of you. Mr. Raynal will ask you, I'm certain, all the questions you want, but you have to wait for the question. You may proceed. Mr. Jones, have you been wanting to uh, apologize to the plaintiffs in this case for a long time? Yes. And what would you like to say to them? That I never intentionally tried to hurt you. I never even said your name until this case came to court. Uh, I didn't even really know who you were until a couple years ago when all this started up. The internet had a lot of questions. I had questions. And over that six, seven year period before I got sued, or six year period, it, it's clear you can see the whole progression of us, the few times we covered it, trying to actually find out what happened. And that's really been my big frustration is that the people have said that I'm personally trying to hurt them or coming after them. When I question every big event, and a lot of times it turns out that we've not been uh, told the truth. And a perfect example is today where they play a 30 or a one minute clip. And I had just done that this morning. And I knew that I said, I believe that Scarlett Lewis is real and she's a really you know, nice person and she's really a sweet person. And then I went through and talked about her ex-husband too. And then, the, then I said, I believe they're being fed and manipulated. And this is a perfect. Sustained. This is a perfect. Sustained. When you hear sustained, you have to stop okay. talking. Okay. Okay. Do you feel that the video clip was a fair representation of what uh, what you meant to convey? No, it had the front and back. No. Okay. And why wasn't it fair? Because it had the front and back cut off of it to totally misrepresent the apology at the end. And at the first, where I said, I believe she's a real person and lost her child. So someone edited that and then showed it to her, and then they brought it in here and played it to show it to you. And I think you should ask to see the full segment. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, I want to ask you some questions about where you grew up and how you came to have your business. Can you... Let us know, where, where are you from in Texas originally? I first was born in Dallas, then I grew up in a suburb of Dallas called Rockwell. And how old were you when you moved to Austin? Sixteen. And can you tell the members of the jury why your family relocated to Austin? My dad sold his dental practice, and there was too much crime in Dallas, and Austin was a safer city. Were you still in high school when you moved here? Yes. And did you graduate from high school? Yes. Here in Austin? Yes. And um, did you go to college? 
No. Well, I mean, I went a few years at community college. Are you married? Yes. How many children do you have? I have four. Can you tell us their names and their ages? I've got to. Do you say their names? Well, you, do. you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, well, there's their the, ages. Sure. The, there's, there's Rex, who's 19, Charlotte, who's 18, Georgia, who's 14, and Veronica, who's 5. And is your wife present in the courtroom today? She is. She's right there. Okay. And what's her name? Erica. I want to ask you some questions about how you got started up in, in media with your radio show. Okay? How old were you when you first uh, felt that you wanted to be on the air, that you wanted to, to work in media? When I was about 17, I really liked listening to talk radio. And I'd grown up with my dad on road trips listening to like Larry King when he was still on radio. And I really liked Larry King on radio and then also on CNN. And I also liked Howard Stern, I thought he was funny. And I really wanted to be a talk show host. And how did you take that desire to be a talk show host and, and those early influences, how did you translate that into action? How did you first get on the air? I had been out of high school about a year and a half, two years, and I went down and took classes at the Access TV station here in Austin, one of the first places ever have Access TV, had one of the best systems. So they had uh, a lot of equipment and a lot of studio space. A lot of it was old, antiquated, but was still very useful. So I became self-taught uh, with that equipment, and in about 94, 95, and then 95 started doing uh, my own little call-in shows. And then those became pretty popular uh, quickly. And so the phone rang, and a, and a DJ by the name of Shark Man, who had a national show that was managing the local station, 98.9, said, I think you should come in and do like a three-hour radio show this Saturday and see what people think. And they had Howard Stern on their station. They had G. Ward Lady, a bunch of other big hosts. They had some other big local hosts who couldn't like the phone lines up. And the first time I went in, they got about 100 calls the first night. How old were you? I was, uh, I think I was 21, 22 by then. And what was the format of your early shows on Austin Public Access TV? It wasn't as conspiratorial or political. There was some of that because there was other people doing those shows, and I already knew about that information. Uh, but it was just all over the map. It was just really calling shows, different topics, did variety shows like Car Pumpkins on TV on Halloween. and. You know, have a guy come in with his pet monkey and it you know, dances around. Just fun stuff. Because I also liked uh, Johnny Carson growing up. Did people like your show? They did. And did you, uh, did your, did your show, I mean, it sounds sort of like a, almost like a Wayne's World kind of thing. Uh, I think Wayne's World's a good way to describe it. And did it, uh, did it win any accolades? It did. It, it, it won Best of Austin a few times in the newspaper and pretty much started getting written about and even national coverage in about two years. Really, and so tell us in those, you've told us already about Larry King and about Howard Stern. Who would you say influenced you artistically in the format and, and how you, you did your show uh, then and became the, the man you are today? I mean, really, I, I, I listened to Larry King a lot because my dad listened to him on the radio um, a lot when I was, from the time I was like six, seven, I remember listening to Larry King. And then I'd watch him a lot of nights at home in junior high and high school. So I would, I would say more than anybody, Larry King. Okay. And did there come a time when, because of your success and having uh, won this uh, Listener's Choice Award or Viewer's Choice Award, that uh, you were able to be syndicated? Well, I won a couple of those. I don't think the syndication folks were even paying attention to that. I, I built a studio in a bedroom in my house because they wouldn't put the equipment in at the local station where I had the top ratings. Um, to syndicate it, and so I went home, got the equipment, had an engineer come set it up, and then called a syndication outfit and um, got a sponsor, and then I paid to put it on the satellite. And then I got about probably 60, 70 affiliates in about a month, and then it went up to several hundred affiliates after that. Can you describe for us what the setup was like? Was it in a spare bedroom? It was. And what kind of furniture was in there? It was a simple wooden desk and a microphone and a little mixer and then a, a chair if I had a guest. 
And what is syndication for, for those of us that don't know? Instead of being on one station, it goes up at that time to a satellite. Now a lot of it's over the internet, and then that's beamed back down, and then other stations can pick it up. And so you said you were syndicated on how many uh, radio stations? It fluctuated between 30 or 40 at first and as much as over 200. I would say things that were politically not popular to talk radio, more left-wing things like being anti-war or, or things like that, and I would lose a bunch of stations, and I would gain more stations. But talk radio was mainly conservative. And so when 9-11 came around and I had questions, we lost 70% uh, of our affiliates in one month because I didn't want to, uh, you know, attack all these foreign countries, but I still was steadfast and had that message so that I got real popular with the left wing, but I wasn't trying to be left wing, I was trying to follow the right thing, even though it made me lose most of my radio stations, which is the issue of how I do what I think's right, sometimes I'm wrong, I've been more right than wrong, but I do, don't do it for the monetary thing, I do it to tell the truth, and, or to try to tell the truth, and then the monetary comes with that because people can tell this guy's not reading off the script. Uh, and with that comes its own issues. Uh, but I'm not lying like the corporate media on purpose. That's the big difference. And so let's focus in on this 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 early period. What year did you get syndicated? I syndicated myself in 1998. And at that time, did you already have the the show name, the Info War? Yes. What no, no. It, 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 it wasn't ever called InfoWars, it was just the Alex Jones Show. Because you have to call the show your name, because that's how they did it with the ratings that were written in on little diaries. So to be on radio, you had to say the name of the show coming in and out. It was like TV for Nielsen ratings, so it was the Alex Jones Show. Tell us about InfoWars. How did uh, the name InfoWars come to be, and how did that business start? Vic Freeland, who was an Air Force veteran, who worked in Air Force Intelligence in Vietnam, he was the deputy fire chief in Austin, and he was a listener, and he'd done some talk radio interviews. He'd been on some syndicated shows because of magazine articles he'd written, and he came to some of the events, and he said, listen, you know, you're really involved in an information war, That's that, and, and because all information is propaganda, whether it's true or not, it's called information war, and so you ought to try to get that URL, and he had a big old laptop. He said, look, it's available. Do you want InfoWars.com? And so Vic Freeland got the site. He then, even in his spare time, because he was still working with the fire department then, he uh, built the basic site and stuff, then helped find me a, a volunteer or whatever at first. We didn't really have any money to then start updating the site a little bit every day. And that was in 1997. So, so, so in, InfoWars came from an Air Force intelligence term. So. At the, you had the Alex Jones show that was being uh, broadcast, and you also had InfoWars at the same time. Yes, I had a radio show. At the time, I was doing a local radio show, and then I was doing the, the, the syndicated one out of my house, and then I had a website that I could post articles on or links to to say, look, this is on the site. Go check it out on air. So it's kind of a way to make radio almost like TV because the Internet was starting to become more effective and, and, and more... <laughs> where it actually worked, where it's not effective, where you could actually post stuff and do things. And so we could put things on there and show people what we were talking about. Did you also start making, uh, in order to support InfoWars, did you also start making uh, documentaries? I did start making documentaries. In 1997, I made my first documentary, America Destroyed by Design, about the Great Reset that was coming and the different UN documents that were in it. And then I made more than 25 more films after that. Why, um, why make the films? Most talk show hosts would sell a coffee cup or a newsletter to fund themselves. And I wanted to build a larger news organization because I wanted to do more and I wanted to make documentaries. So I went out and made documentaries and used the money from that to make more documentaries. Because that way you could show people what it was you were talking about in a, in a format before there was really the internet. Because even though the internet was around, it was mainly text and pictures in 96, 90, you know, 7, 8, 9. Documentaries on VHS and the DVD was, uh, you know, the way people interface with that.
And at the time, what was your main topic of interest that you wanted to explore through your documentaries, as well as through your radio show and your website? The plan to cut off U.S. energy reserves that we're now experiencing, the plan to cut off uh, all coal power generation, then gas, and uh, the uh, forced move on to renewables, but that it was in the documents, they didn't plan to even have those. It was a post-industrial uh, program called Agenda 21 that George Herbert Walker Bush signed on to in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. And I read the plan, and it said we're building a post-industrial world. We're going to have a controlled demolition of civilization to force depopulation. And, and now that's mainline news. Bill Maher called for depopulation last Friday night. In addition to your documentaries, uh, are you also an author? I am, yes. How many books have you written? I've written two and contributed to more than 20. We'll talk about your, your latest book later. Um, let's move forward a little bit. In 2001, um, what, if anything, happened with you and, uh, and your program at YouTube? Say that again, please. Did you have a, a, a series of videos that were very successful on YouTube in the early 2000s? Before YouTube came around in, I think, 2004, and then it was out of some guy's garage in San Francisco that bought by Google around that time, we were actually putting out videos ourselves that we were streaming ourselves, but it became too expensive, so we had to stop. We were doing that by, by, by 2000, 2001. And I mean, these are all the technical things, but then Google Video came around, and we had, we had videos on there with, with you know, millions of people that watched them. And we were just putting them out for free. And it was... Um, it was very popular with the left because it was us tracking and, and, and protesting the KKK. It was us exposing police brutality uh, and things like that. And I wasn't trying to be left wing. I just thought those were really important topics. And so I got really popular with the left wing then. And they went and had me speak in San Francisco and New York. And I got big awards you know, by the big uh, liberal Democrat channels. Let me ask you about, about that part, because that's an, an aspect of, of your work and, and who you are that you cultivate, which is different from in the studio. Um, from the very beginning, did you believe it was important to go to demonstrations, to talk to the people on the street, to be part of protest? Absolutely. And how did that play into what you were trying to do at InfoWars? Well, InfoWars is a radio show on TV, and that's really what Oprah Winfrey is too. It's just, a, it, but, but I mean, that's it all goes back to radio when I started 100 years ago, or a little bit more now. And so, that's a separate thing. A talk show with opinions and people debating is like The View. They're not fact checking; they're just giving their opinions. When I'm on the radio show, most of the time I'm just a pundit giving my opinion. Everybody on talk radio knows that. We play devil's advocates. We look at both sides. I don't do that very often now because people can edit tapes and hurt you bad. I would say, well, let's look at this. They're saying this, and they believe that. And now let's look at this. Uh, and as later as I realized my show had a lot more power than I thought, I realized, well, even if I'm not the one editing these tapes, I've got to be more careful because there's bad guys out there that uh, that will do it. But the films I'm proud of, we didn't ever put any films out about Sandy Hook, never had any products about Sandy Hook. The films we would try to really vet and do more journalistic research into and fact check and interview uh, renowned people. I mean, I interviewed like former U.S. Attorney Generals and members of Congress and former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, that's who we would go for these films. Top economists, you know, just really big names for these films. And they were very, very popular. So that's where I've been journalistic and done a good job. I guess with the age of the internet, people grabbing clips out of talk radio or talk TV and mixing it together, I can see how um, it can you know, cause problems. That's why I've admitted that I've made a lot of mistakes, but none of it was done from some master plan uh, deal. It was done from a bedroom in my house. Sustained. So one of the things I notice uh, about you is that you have a very 
uh, distinctive voice. Um, very deep, sort of gravelly voice. Uh, did your voice always sound that way? No. What What happened to your voice? Why does it sound the way it does? Well, I remember the two demonstrations where I finally wrecked it. Um, and one was about, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. It was actually film of it. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you have some way to tie this to the damages portion of this? Uh-uh. No, no, no. I'll address you if I'm talking to you. Uh, this is so that the jury can understand who my client is and, and properly assess his credibility, his demeanor. Sustain. Let me um, ask you directly about InfoWars as we're coming into the period where Sandy Hook occurs. Okay? Yes. About how many employees did you have circa 2012? I'd say about 45, 50. And where were you broadcasting from? What year? 2012. Oh, I was broadcasting from offices, studio. In terms of size, how does that compare to, for example, the New York Times in terms of how many employees? Objection, speculation. I don't believe this witness has any personal knowledge about the New York Times. So you can only answer the question if you have actual knowledge about how many employees the New York Times has. Otherwise, you have to say I don't know. So as a, as a member of the media, are you generally familiar with the different media organizations that are in the, uh, in the industry? Yes. And based on that knowledge of the industry, can you tell us size-wise how your organization compares to the New York Times or to CNN? It's between one one-hundredth and one-twentieth the size of those different organizations if you count for employees and bureaucracy and the number of offices and things they do. So, I want to ask you some questions about the different formats of the different shows that InfoWars broadcasts. Can you tell us what the sort of different segments are that would appear on a given day at InfoWars circa 2012? There was my four-hour radio show that in 2012 was just a webcam on me for people that wanted to watch it online. And then it was just it was me at a desk with a camera in 2012. And then, um, I mean, that was it, basically. At some point, did you all begin to have additional segments besides just you doing your radio show and answering calls? Well, yes, I mean, that's, now I understand what your first question was. What was the different types of media we were doing? There was the syndicated radio show that was also had a visual component of you know, digital video online. And then there was documentary making, and that's what I had 10 or so people working on with me. And then I started to develop reporters and people to go out and actually cover like live events and protests and things that were going on. Uh, and then we also did everything in house, so we had our own shipping department uh, to be able to ship out you know, books and films. Not just my books and films, but a lot of other authors' books and films. We interview a lot of those authors. And so that's what we were doing uh, back then. Now, the, your, uh, your radio show, was it purely uh, a call-in show? Or did you also go sort of on, on rants about different issues that you were seeing? Yes, we would, we would have a lot of calls. Sometimes the whole show would be calls. Sometimes it would be all guests. Sometimes... I would uh, just decide that I had so much news that I was going to just cover up to 100 stories on there and just look at them. The audience knows whether it's the BBC or whether it's an InfoWars story or, or whatever it is, they can choose, they can go look it up for themselves. We're just covering what's in this. And so we just bam, bam, bam. Uh, it's, it's the same way today, like Pelosi's in Taiwan. What do you think of it? You think there's going to be a war? The Chinese are threatening war. 
oh look, uh, Biden fell down again. Oh look, uh, you know that they found another trailer full of 50 dead people in Texas. This is horrible. We, we got to do something about this. And it's just coming up next. It's real simple. I got a stack of news. Uh, we're going to play a video clip of Bill Maher, um, you know, saying we need to depopulate the, the human population. And we got well, let's take calls. What do you think about Bill Maher saying we should get rid of the majority of people? Well, who's going to do that? You know, who's going to do the killing? I think this is wrong. I think it's dangerous. I think it sounds like Hitler. I mean, that's what we do. And how did, um, at the time, 2012, how did you all source the, or how did you source the stories that you wanted to cover during that segment of your talk radio? Or, or 95 percent of what we were covering was mainstream news going, look, they're saying this, do you believe it? Or what do you make of this? Uh, the, I mean, it's that kind of thing, is that we would simply do what talk radio does. That's what talk radio does. That's what Larry King did, is stack the news articles, talk about what's going on, what people are saying, ask callers, what do you think of that? Do you buy that? What do you think is going to happen next? Uh, are there really WMDs in Iraq? Are they lying about it? And then the talk show hosts make their predictions about what they think, and then the talk radio listeners basically keep note and see who's the most accurate, and it becomes a big game to see who has made the best predictions and things like that. And so that kind of lends itself to to the very nature of a soapbox is people speculating. That's, that's the nature of people going to a park and, and standing up at Speaker's Corner in London for 600 years and giving their opinion. That's what free speech is. Now, please tell the members of the jury, has your uh, method where you, you get your stories, has that changed over the years from 2012 until today? No, it's not really changed. I mean, we have clips from the news where it's like, here's a clip of this person saying this. And we always try to actually play it in context. That's most of our clips are about two minutes long. So they're not little deceptive clips. We want to show what somebody actually said. And we'll just play a clip, give our opinion, and ask callers what they think about it. Or, again, we'll say, should Pelosi go to Taiwan, the Chinese are threatening war. And I said yesterday, I said, I don't really like Pelosi, and I don't want war with China, but I think it's good she's going, because we should stand up for ourselves and not be pushed around. And then we take calls and say, what do you think? Well, I think you're wrong. We shouldn't go over there. I think you're right. I mean, it's really that simple. Do you also, uh, did you then and do you now also hold debates? We do. How do you decide... Um, to host a debate and who are going to be the debaters? Any issue that is being contested that people think is interesting. We had a Sandy Hook debate where we had a newspaper reporter on who said he thought that it really happened. And we had like a professor, or whatever exactly who on, who, who, who thought that there was questions. And that's the type of thing that we did. And I can understand then that people again take clips out of that and move that around and that it, it can cause problems and that's why now, I mean I can say I'm more, I'm more timid even though the, the head of the state police questions Uvalde in Texas and even though they stood down for 77 minutes, I think it happened but I've just gone, whoa, I'm going to try to leave this alone as much as possible just because they'll take what I've said out of context but my listeners are now mad at me because I'm not covering it when, I mean something went on 77 minutes and the kids are begging for help, and the police just stand there, and the state, the state police in Texas say that the head of the state police says, we don't know the truth. And it's because of things like that that people just get completely blown away and confused by what's going on. But now I realize that those are such touchy subjects that I don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And is that a result of this case? And, and, you know, it's a result of a lot of stuff, like... In the past, I would have gotten in a car and driven down there, and I think that's what journalists should do. But I, we didn't go down there because I don't want to be associated with the corporate media and the lawyers and the people that swarm around these mass shootings. I don't want to be like them. So they've accused me of being Mr. Mass Shooting and all this stuff with Sandy Hook when I've covered less than one-tenth of one percent over the years. And so I don't want to be like them. So we need to send reporters to Uvalde, and the American people can figure out what's going on. But, but I'm not going to get involved in it. So we've talked about the call-in portion. We've talked about hosting debates. Do you also um, 
interviews. And I think we talked about doing the news based on what you're reading. Do you also uh, interview guests? I do. And do you do you always select the guest that you're going to interview, or sometimes does one of your producers suggest to you, hey, you should interview this person? In radio, the producer is the person paying for it. You know, in Hollywood or TV, the person paying for the entertainment show is called the producer. In radio, it just means the booker. And then they call and get the guests on the line or on Skype, and they check into the person. We get all these guest offers and things. In the past, I would do cursory stuff and sometimes mail it in with guests. That's just what talk radio does. I mean, I was a producer for other shows 25 years ago, not just my own show. And they were pressuring us. I was helping uh, produce on a sports show to get up to five guests an hour. So you're just calling people that are already you know, in the news, that are sportscasters or pundits, just like ESPN now. You show these different writers and talk shows on the show. So it, it, it's the same for political stuff. You're just, you're just getting guests that are in the news, that are interesting, and then getting their opinion about things. And so now most of the time, though, I say, I want this person, I want that person, um, and I'm more in control of the guests that I have. But, but in the past, um, more, we let more things driven by the Internet and by 4chan and 8chan that in every case I've had problems has been a curse. I'm not attacking everybody that's on there, but that's, I tell my producers, do not touch it when it's on there. Because it, it's just it's the kiss of death, and it causes nothing but problems. Why? Um, why is it? Do you think it's important to interview people who um, are causing a stir on the internet or on social media? Why do you feel like that's a good thing to do in terms of your listeners? Well, I mean, most of the time we're not just interviewing people that have caused a stir. When I say like there's a big controversy or there's a big story, if there's riots in Hong Kong and we can find a reporter who will come on the show, we get them on. It's whatever the big topic is. That's just how news is. Uh, and, and, and more and more, I don't really follow the news model of covering the news. In the past I did. We still do it a lot. But now I mainly just talk about philosophy and the big picture and then have some guests on. And the show's gotten more... Christian, you know, because I'm a Christian, but as things progress, all things happening in the world, I'm moving more towards uh, doing a self-help, uh, life experience type show than the political show. In fact, I've been trying to segue out of this just because I think we have to change individuals, kind of like Scarlett was saying earlier, more than we're going to change the world. If we can't change ourselves, then we're never going to be able to change the world. And I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've learned a lot in that process. And I've also learned how the corporate media is able to completely manipulate a story once you're caught in it, and then manipulate other people. And if anything, I want to teach people about how that process worked, because they say I'm the mastermind that figured out how to manipulate people, and I didn't have any understanding of it coming, and, and now I've seen it from the inside, the way this stuff goes on. And I, again, I think only getting the individual awake and aware and, and not under its control is the way to beat it. And you can't just cover a bunch of news and get somebody to understand that. You, you can't be told about the matrix, you gotta see it. Let's slow down a little bit. And um, I wanna ask you about sort of how your, with these responsibilities, how your typical day sort of shapes up, okay? How many hours a day are you on the air? I'm on the air about four hours a day. And since when have you been on the air about four hours a day? I've been on the air four hours a day since about 1997, 98. And in order to prepare for those four hours that you're going to be on the air every day, well, let me ask you this. How many days a week? I'm on the air uh, six days a week. 
So in order to prepare for four hours a day, six days a week, how many hours per day do you spend on prep for your show? I spend about two hours at night, about two hours in the morning, and then I do some research in the afternoon. In addition to prepping for your show for about four hours and being on the air for about four hours, do you have other responsibilities? I do. And what are your other business responsibilities? Well, we don't have a lot of sponsorship because with sponsorship comes the control of the sponsor's political views. And so we, we sell books and films and other things uh, to fund ourselves. And then you've got to source that, you've got to have that, you've got to get the deals on that because a lot of times, like in the case of horrible food, we're only making 20, 30% on it. Uh, so it's, 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 you're, you're competing against Amazon. And so about you've got to really spend some time on that. And about how many, so about how many hours per day do you spend on general business administration as well? Two or three hours. So your average day, would you say, is somewhere between 11 hours, 12 hours a day? Yes. Six days a week? Yes. Do you depend on other people to help you produce your show and decide what you're going to talk about? I do. I depend on my crew, and I depend on, um, I mean, really what they do is they just give me hundreds of clips that are in mainstream news, alternative news, things that are happening, video clips, and I'll sit there and my computer and just review them, and then I tell them just print me the top stories off of 10 or 15 news sources, and I say go through everything, randomly change it up. Uh, so everything from Japanese news to news in Mexico to uh, you know the BBC to uh, the LA Times uh, to just everything, and then also alternative media. Uh, but more and more, we just show clips of what's actually happening out in the world that's not disputed. There's just stacks of news. You can be on air 24 hours a day. All you're doing is like a curator just showing people, hey, we looked at this, we think it's interesting. We looked at that. Uh, the, the idea that there's like certain stories that are like these big bonanza stories that we focus on is, is, is just not the case. There is a glut of news and information. So we've talked about your responsibilities and your duties and your work day at InfoWars. Do you also appear on uh, other people's shows? Yes, I've, I've been on thousands of different programs in the last 27, 28 years. Any that we would have heard of? I've been on Howard Stern and on his network many times. I have been on Joe Rogan's show many times even predating his current podcast, known in 25 years. I've been on The View, I've been on Piers Morgan, I've been on 20 or 30 BBC shows, I've been on Japanese television, I've been on, I've been on Saudi Arabian TV, I've been on Israeli TV, I've been, I mean I basically, I've been on Brazilian television, Brazilian radio, Mexican TV and radio, I mean I've been on basically a lot. Let's focus in, in the year 2012, how many hours per day was InfoWars broadcasting? Not just your show, but everything. Well, there's broadcasting and then there's just videos that we're uploading. I mean, I'd say... How many hours of content? Per day? Six hours, seven hours. Okay, and um, in... 2013, about how many hours per day? 2018? No, 2013. Oh, 2013. Uh, the same amount. And 2014? I'd say a little more, maybe seven. And 15? The same. 16? The same. 17? <clears throat> sorry, just one second. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not torn larynx. That's why my voice is like that. Uh, so, uh, sorry, what were you saying? I was asking you how many hours per day um, content is being produced and uploaded or streamed on InfoWars in 2017. 
probably seven, eight hours as well. And 18? Then it increases to 10 hours a day. Or in 17 it did. Okay. In 17 it increases to 10 hours a day. And then in, um, in that state of about that. And it stayed const constant now at about 10 hours per day since then? It, 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 there's 10 hours that's always there that's talk radio on TV. And then we also put out some other reports and videos. Okay, so the answers you just gave us of seven hours per day basically up until 2016 and then starting in 2017, 10 hours per day, that is content that's on the radio that's being streamed. And being picked up out of some radio stations. So as we sit here today, since 2017, InfoWars has been producing about 3,120 hours of content per year. I haven't done the math. Is, is that what that calculates out to? I will represent to you that it is. It's uh, I mean, six days a week. We do a little bit less on uh, Sunday. Sometimes do stuff on Saturday. I mean, that, that sounds about right. There's no exact number. I never... We never organized it all, so I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. When did you start bringing on other hosts that have their own programs? <coughs> I think we started the nightly news in like 2000, and, like 2000. And, 15, I don't have the exact dates. So so we started the nightly news that David Knight and, and Leanne McAdoo and others would host sometime before the 2016 election. How did you pick who was going to be the first uh, the first host of the nightly news? Well, I hosted it sometimes instead of David Knight, mainly. <coughs> I'm sorry, I had a really bad deal here. Do um, you need some more water? No, it, it's... It, I've, it's a torn larynx. It's got a lot worse. It's real bad this week, so that's what's going on. It's like the voice like that. Um, it, it'll get better in a minute. What were we saying? I was asking if... Uh, <coughs> Sorry, go ahead. If uh, David Knight won a contest in order to be on the show. Yes, he did. Tell us about how that worked. We had a contest of news videos and reports to the best. And I, think, I don't think he won. I, I think he entered the contest... <laughs> but then we we uh, hired him. He came out with his family from North Carolina. And he was an engineer and also had done a lot of uh, writing for publications and things. And so <coughs> he was just a natural for the show. Mr. Jones. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I just, I just I meant to have surgery on this. It's, it's been like this for 10 years, but it's really bad now. That's the exception to the food in the corporate. <laughs> there you go. Alright, go ahead. Um, Alex, uh, you obviously have a very busy work schedule to yourself for yourself. Do you tell the other hosts what to say or what to cover? <coughs> We're starting to. <laughs> well I mean no, not the past, not really, very rarely, other than I try to pick people that already have done shows, that I've seen their work, that I think are trying to tell the truth, that are smart, and who are funny. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, but they're definitely, we're trying to put in more, more oversight and be more careful, obviously, about what we do. We've, we've definitely learned a lesson from this process of not just things we did wrong, but how people misrepresent what we've done. Is it fair to say that yourself and most of your hosts are self-taught uh, through the radio business? Owen has a degree in, in media, but he'll tell you he didn't learn anything with that. It was all working at those radio stations from the bottom, you know, up. He got on air to the top. And it's the same way Owen had a similar deal that I did. I mean, I volunteered when I was at Talk Radio. Um, I wasn't paid the first six months, and then I got into sales and things. 
but I was I was doing producing for sports shows. We uh, I even got hired by the Howard Stern show uh, to do a, a interview with uh, Dennis Hopper and, and some other folks at, at, at a big film festival at the Governor's Mansion. Uh, so I did that, I and mean, I worked for Howard Stern on that job. Uh, so I was doing everything, and then that was unpaid uh, to, to 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 do that. Would you say that the organization is more like a, a radio show or more like a, like a newspaper, like the uh, the Austin Statesman? No, we don't pretend to be. We're more like the op-ed page in a newspaper, giving our opinion, than say the investigative journal section of something. So yes, we're we're like the op-ed, or we're like the funny papers in, 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 as well. I mean, we've got really serious stuff we do, where we say, "Here's the documents. Here's where they said it. This is what's going on." And then we also have the op-ed opinion stuff we do, which is what talk radio is. And then we also um, have satire and uh, you know things like that, where it's completely obvious that I'm dressed up in like like Cobra Commander that I'm not actually Cobra Commander. People know that's a joke. Let's talk a little bit about where you get your funding. Um, when's the last time you had a, a corporate sponsor for InfoWars? You mean a big one? Yeah. I had some corporate sponsors when I was against George George, Herbert, George W. Bush and the war. We lost a lot because we were anti-war, but we still had some big ones. I mean, we had like car companies, uh, clothing-wise, everything. We were making a lot of money to expand the operation. Going back to about 2005, up to when Obama got in. And then being anti-war was not allowed anymore. For whatever reason, I wasn't anti-Obama, I was anti-war. So I continue with being anti-war, and we lost all our sponsors. We lost, uh, that was almost, was about 80% of the money we were making with sponsors. You know, started, we lost about $10 million. It was gross money to fund the operation right away when uh, we didn't, uh, didn't toe the line with all the wars. And so when you lost all that corporate sponsorship because of your, your position against the war, did uh, you transition to a different business model? Yes. We'd already been selling some books and films, but we accelerated it. And I said, well, I'm not going to let them shut me down. I said this on air. I said, you want to shut us down over $10 million a year. I'm going to, I remember saying, I'm going to go to $70 million a year, and I'm going to put it into everything. We're going to advertise. We're going to explode. And so that was my promise, and I fulfilled it. And why is it important for you to be self-funded? That's what the system fears. It's actually come out in some of the presidential library documents out of uh, Little Rock. That they, the system fears any independent organic media, whether it's liberal or conservative, that isn't controlled by the big corporations. They want a fake left and a fake right that's synthetic. And, and by fake, they're, they're real groups. They just kind of toe a line, stay within certain guardrails, and then society doesn't ever change for the better. Instead, we need independent grassroots media that is self-funded, whether it be through donations or whether it be through product sales, so that we can have real diversity of ideas in this world we live in. What do you, you use the term synthetic as well as fake. What do you mean when you say synthetic? You know, these are a lot of military terms that I learned just by researching psychological warfare, because I knew that they were using it against us, so I went and last 20 years, got some of the declassified ones. But a synthetic event is real stuff happening, but they put in place people to help it happen and kind of provocateur to get it started. So if you have two pit bulls killing each other, that's a real event, but people that throw them in that pen together for that fight, they made it happen. They brought the dogs there. They raised the dogs. They trained them how to fight. They threw them in the pit. So there's two dogs really killing each other, but it's synthetic because people made it happen. So when I talk about staged, most of the time I mean they knew it was going to happen, and they stood down and let it happen. And that was my view the first few years of Sandy Hook. 
Anybody can pull up the Washington Post, you name it, about FBI going out there, him threatening to shoot up a school, nothing being done. Same story, CIA, he was hacking stuff. Was that, so that's where everybody thought it was really suspicious up front was because those telltale signs that we've seen before of those type of synthetic connections, which don't always mean it was staged, but that's the type of things people look for. So, so you've, got, you've got different types of false flags. You've got synthetic is, 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 is a way to describe it really happened, but there were, there were forces in there letting it happen. This kind of like the idea of, of purposefully focusing people on a particular news story because you want them to vote a certain way or do a certain thing. A synthetic event. Wait, 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 wait. When you hear objection, you have to stop. Objection, please. Sustain. Give us another example of how that would work. Well, take that clip earlier today of the air. At the beginning of the clip, I say I, I believe Scarlett Lewis is is real. I believe her son died. I'm very, very sorry. And they cut that off the front. And then they cut me saying I'm sorry off the end. And they brought a real clip, but it's synthetic to try to deceive you. And I hope you get to see the real clip. And then you'll figure out everything else that's been going on. Let's go back to InfoWars and its business model. Um, do you sell vitamins? Yes. Are your vitamins FDA certified? No, they're not. Why not? 1996 law, the FDA has no jurisdiction over any nutraceuticals, not the ones at Whole Foods, not the ones at GNC, and not ours. And ours are private labeled, top brands that are sold at Whole Foods and GNC. We have them made by the top lab recognized in the United States. All we do is put our label on it so we know it's triple tested, the highest quality, and that's why people love it because it is the best out there. And I'll give it to Whole Foods, and I'll give it to GNC and others. They've got the same stuff. There's all sorts of crap you can buy at a gas station out there. That's not what ours is. I mean, we buy our PQQ and, and CoQ10 from the Japanese. I mean, it's the best. It costs five times what synthetic PQQ and CoQ10 cost. Yes, barely. You gave reading glasses? No, I'm, I'm barely sure. Well, let me walk it up to you, and you can tell us just generally what kind of document that is. Looks like some type of sales log. And can you tell us what year it begins in? Uh, looks like uh, September 2015. And can you flip to the last page and tell us what year it ends? It ends. It ends in December 2018. If you flip back to the front, can you see the headings? Yes. Can you see the column that you're right? Yeah. Don't worry, it's not COVID, it's the torn larynx. <coughs> sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we're sorry, go ahead. There is a uh, column that is labeled invoice. Uh -huh. Yes. Would that represent gross sales? I believe so. And let's flip to the last page and you can tell us what the gross sales number is. One hundred sixty-five million two hundred thirty thousand.
Can you tell the members of the jury how much of that represents profit versus just gross revenue? The, it depends on what product it is. Some products make 20%, some products make 60%. Like on a book, you know, you might be 20, 30% on food, it's that, and that's the biggest type things. Um, on supplements, if they're on sale, you make 50% of it. If it's not on sale, uh, you make you know, more than that, sometimes 100% markup, uh, but usually it's on sale. So it, it, it really all depends. I can tell you bottom line numbers, though, uh, of, of how much money I've been paid, things like that, or how much money's there. Before we, we discuss that, let's, um, let's talk about InfoWars, the organization. Would you describe it as organized or chaotic? It's a mix of both, but it is the opposite of corporate, and there's no corporate culture, and there's no, um, people are very happy there overall, and it's very, very diverse, and people stay there a long time, and, but, but I would say the sales department and, and, the, and the shopping cart, that's in another building, it's not even there, and it's kind of like, Two groups that normally talk to each other. So the disorganization is between people that do production and the people that do the sales in the warehouse and stuff. And we're trying to get that integrated. But let me maybe this is an easier way to go after it. Let's discuss, for example, email. How much email does Infowars routinely get? I, I, mean, I, I mean, I know when we looked to comply with the discovery, which we complied with, it was over 10 million that they had a search that was still in the inbox unopened. So it was 10 million unopened and a few hundred thousand opened. And uh, that's why there's a lot of stuff we never saw because it was in the 10 million emails. So about how much email would you say you get on a given day just sent by random people? I can't answer that because about 10 years ago I got rid of my email address because it was getting 20,000 a day. And so that's, that's, that was one of the things they didn't believe there wasn't an Alex at InfoWars because, well, of course you got an email. I'm like, no, I don't. Uh, and uh, that's like it doesn't exist because I can't read that. It's just I can't read 20,000 emails. How many employees would InfoWars have to have, in your view, if you were to actually read every message, every email, every tip that's sent in? It would take 10, 15, 20 people we go bankrupt, which we are now. Um, going back to, I want to ask you a question. There's a, a term that's been thrown around um, during this trial of, of the truther community or truth People, um, what does that? I have a question about anything outside the presence of the jury. I don't know if you want to do that now or if you're going to do that. That really depends on you, Mr. Bankston, whether you think I need to hear it now or later. I'm, I'm worried that you do hear it because I'm going to so I'd like to. All right. Um, we're going to just, just sit tight for a second. We're going to take a break. I don't know if it will eat up the rest of the afternoon or not, so I'm not going to release you in case it doesn't. I want to not waste any time, um, and so I'll send someone back if you're going to go or if you're going to come back. Remember all of my instructions. On the chance that I don't see you before tomorrow, please arrive at 845 like normal for us to get started. All right, thank you. All rise.
just have to wait until the jury has moved to their space before you can leave the room. All right. Hmm? All right, Mr. Bankston. I don't know if someone on your honor, but I need to bring a couple of motions through for jury instructions, and then I'm going to go ahead and bring a motion for sanctions right now on the record. I know you don't want to hear it from the but the jury instructions are pending now. Um, we have, as you know, there's been a pattern of Mr. Raynald blatantly violating MIL's and court rules. Um, it, it, Mr. Raynald just absolutely solicited direct testimony from Mr. Jones that he is bankrupt. Mr. Jones just testified straight into the record that he's bankrupt. Which is not true, which is a sham that's going on right now, which Mr. Jones pulled $60 million out of his company last year. But the most important part, Your Honor, is you have a standing motion, you have a motion limiting entered in this case that is in no uncertain terms that they cannot, due to violating your orders repeatedly to provide networks information, they cannot apply evidence in that work. Mr. Jones just intentionally did that in violation of your order to attempt to poison this compensatory damage verdict to try to tell this jury that he's broke when he's not. And that's in violation of your order. And Mr. Randolph drew that right out of him, totally expecting that to happen. It was very obvious from the question he asked. He wants Mr. Jones to tell this jury he's broke. That is ridiculous. The second is that he absolutely, Mr. Jones just fully testified that we complied with discovery. I am under the standing MIL not permitted to mention discovery disputes. But we both know Mr. Jones did anything but comply with discovery and did that for four years, thumbing his nose in the face of this court in rank contempt. There needs to be an instruction to the jury that he did not comply with discovery, that materials that were repeatedly ordered by this court will not turn over. Some of that includes his net worth information. And you are, I also would like an instruction to the jury to disregard and strike his comments that about him being bankrupt, which they are to take as having no evidentiary value and is not true. Uh, otherwise, I am deeply prejudiced going forward. The other thing that Mr. Jones testified to is that he doesn't, doesn't communicate by email doesn't have emails to turn over. You know from a motion for sanctions that involved defendants' former counsel tampering with evidence that they tampered with a piece of evidence to hide the fact from me that Mr. Jones does have an email and was communicating with him. To this date, we still don't know what that email is. We don't know how we've been produced any of it. But Mr. Jones has just repeatedly lying on the stand in ways that I cannot counter because they deal with your discovery rulings. Um, I want the jury to be instructed to disregard all that testimony. That, that it has been already found by the court that Mr. Jones does have an email, that he did not turn those emails over, and did not admit and deny the existence of that email, that he did not comply with discovery, that he is not bankrupt and the jury is not to consider him. Additionally, on top of those instructions, we are now formally moving to sanctions against both Mr. Jones and Mr. Raynal, who we believe intentionally solicited testimony to sabotage this jury. And I would not normally make that accusation so openly, against a fellow attorney, had that attorney not continually violated rules of this court on every single day, including before putting Mr. Jones on, clearly attempting to solicit from a witness an attorney-client communication earlier into this day, which, as we've seen him violate rules that a first-year law student should know, a first-day law student should know not to ask the plaintiff about her communications with counsel. This is absolutely in bad faith. Therefore, we'd like jury instructions and we're filing a motion. Would you like to respond, Mr. Raymond? If Your Honor thinks it necessary, I will. I think that Your Honor can review the transcript of my questions. I don't think my questions elicited that testimony. Uh, I'm sorry that that came out. I don't think that there was anything I could have done in my questioning uh, that, that would have prevented it from happening. I know that Your Honor has contemporaneous transcript and can look it over. So I, I would urge you to do so um, because I, you know, I'm sorry it happened. I tried to move on very, very quickly. I think Your Honor saw me raise my hand. Um, but I can only ask the questions. Let me ask Mr. Jones a couple of questions while you're under oath. Yes, sir. What did your attorney tell you about your testimony today? Not, let me, I want to be very careful. Um, were you instructed that there were some things you could not testify about? Yes. And do you remember what they were? Yes. And what were they? Just top level. I'm trying to remember that first there was a document you put out saying don't talk about free speech, don't uh, don't say I'm innocent, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other stuff, and then 
and then that got withdrawn. You, I believe you withdrew it. I think it's called motion limiting. Okay. So you don't remember? No, no, no. I, I, no. I remember currently. Stop. Uh, <laughs> you remember day one where I said it's an unfair world and you don't get to interrupt the judge? Do you remember uh, that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. But the judge gets to interrupt you. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Um, okay, so you don't really remember what you were not supposed to testify about. That's what I'm hearing, because you said, yes, I remember, no, I don't remember. Well, let me, I'm trying to remember. Okay, um, I don't want you to try and remember. No, I, I, I don't want you to try and remember. You either knew or you don't. Um, I remember him saying, don't talk about, don't talk about the financial stuff or something like that, like a week ago when I asked him. And then I remember today, watching part of Heslin's testimony when I was coming here and him talking about the bankruptcy. So I thought that was totally fine. I mean, he gets to, why, why not just do what he gets to do? Mr. Jones, no. stop making, just stop. Okay. All right, um, you can sit down, Mr. Jones. Okay. Do you have any reply, Mr. Bingston? Uh, not really. And I'm actually, good. before I hear from you, you know whose obligation it is, Mr. Raynal, to make sure that any witness you put forward understands the orders in limine, understands what he is not allowed to say because of orders that I have made before now, right? As an attorney, it's an impossible position that to be That wasn't the question I asked you. I would... I know that it is my obligation to communicate your honor's orders. Beyond that, I, I think that's all I need. Your honor, the only thing I would say, and I actually probably do need to ask for an additional jury instruction. Uh, during the same testimony, and the reason why I do not believe that Mr. Raynal was keeping a tight leash on his client for MIL, and why I do believe he was intentionally trying to violate them, is Mr. Raynal had a long series of questions about whether Mr. Jones is a pundit who merely gives his opinion does not provide facts, was not stating facts, was only giving his opinion. That's another one of your motion in limine, that the defendants cannot contest in this case that the statements that they were giving were merely protected opinions and not statements of fact. That all came out intentionally for Mr. Raynal, and you know too through the rest of this testimony that he's been intentionally trying to drive out the viability sections of your MIL. As we said yesterday, we think he's intentionally trying to bring this trial. And if, and if it, it really is a matter of Oh, whoops, I guess I forgot to remind my client not to suddenly blurt out to the jury that he's broke on the day when he was screaming that he's going to do it, right? When he says, I'm going to come in there and I'm, this judge ain't going to hold me down. It's going to be her Waterloo. And then he comes in here and do that. Maybe we could forgive it if he wasn't also asking questions that were directly in violation of motion. And, Your Honor, we believe this is just egregious. Your Honor, if All I right. may on that point, just on that point, um, Your Honor has ruled already that during this phase of the trial, we are to discuss, and, and I, over my objection, all the issues raised by Rule 4111. I've been objecting to that. Except I, net worth. Well, except net worth. And within that, for the jury to make an accurate determination, you need to talk about intent. You need to talk about degree of malice. You need to talk about how extreme the behavior was or wasn't. And so the testimony I'm eliciting, which I believe, I, I've never said, nor has my client said, that your honor's ruling shouldn't stand. But in order for the jury to be able to make a decision, they need to know the entire context and they need to understand the mental state of the participants. Because if not, they can't render well, a ruling on the punitive problem damages. problem is, and you know this, and we've already had this conversation multiple times in this trial, in addition to it before this trial, the time for that was during discovery, when Mr. Jones chose not to fully participate. It is not the time to do that now. If there is anything that he would like to put forth as a defense, he needed to do it a year ago during the discovery process. It's too late now. And when you ask questions that imply or outright say that he didn't know how to be a journalist or he wasn't a journalist, you're calling into question my ruling, which was based on a long-standing principle in the law, that if you intentionally, repeatedly, and over 
years, in this case, again and again, refuse to participate in discovery, that is proof that you do not have a meritorious defense. That was the basis of my ruling. You cannot attack that in this trial. For motions to, for sanctions, you've got to write them down. They're under advisement until they're written down and filed. We'll take that up post-trial. Your Honor, so that I don't run afoul of your ruling. I'm not done. I'm sorry. You don't even know what it is yet. For the motions seeking sanctions against Mr. Jones and Mr. Raynal, you have to write those down. They have to be filed with the court. I'll take them up post-trial. That may mean during deliberations. That may mean later in August. I don't know. Assume it'll be as soon as I have time, so file a response if you want to. Mr. Jones, you may not say to this jury that you complied with discovery. That is not true. You may not say it again. You may not tell this jury that you are bankrupt. That is also not true. You may have filed for bankruptcy. I don't know that, but I've heard that. It doesn't what, that doesn't make a person or a company bankrupt. You're already under oath to tell the truth. You've already violated that oath twice today in just those two examples. It seems absurd to instruct you again that you must tell the truth while you testify, yet here I am. You must tell the truth while you testify. This is not your show. You need to slow down and not take what you see as opportunities to further the message you're wanting to further. And instead, only answer the specific and exact question you have been asked. No asides. The comments about discovery, the comments about the larynx or whatever it was, the comments about bankruptcy, none of those were responsive to questions. They were just you abusing my tolerance and making asides to the jury improperly and in <coughs> these two cases, untruthfully. Do you understand what I have said? Yes I or no? Do you understand what I have said? Yes, I believe what I said was true. So I don't Yes, know. you believe everything you say is true, but it isn't. Your beliefs do not make something true. That is, that is what we're doing here. Just because you claim to think something is true does not make it true. It does not protect you. It is not allowed. You are under oath. That means things must actually be true when you say them. Don't talk. You understand what I have said. I do understand. You understand the instructions I have given you for your testimony in court. Yes. I'm not going to bring the jury back today. My staff is listening. They can let the jury go home. We'll start back up tomorrow. When you come back to testify tomorrow, one more time. No asides. Do you understand what I mean when I say no asides? Yes. Answer only the question asked of you. Do you understand what I mean when I say only answer the question asked of you? Yes. You understand you will still be under oath when you return tomorrow morning to yes. complete your testimony. And you understand that that means you must only testify about things that are true. To the best of my knowledge. If you don't know something, you don't say it. If you're asked about your opinion, you can give your opinion. 
But if you're asked to relate something that's <coughs> truthful and a fact, it must be truthful and a fact. Not an assumption, not a guess, not an opinion. Do you understand? Yes. All right. You can sit down. Anything else? Yes, sir. Just so that I can make sure that I don't run afoul of Your Honor's motion in limine or earlier rulings. Just to be clear, we call them motions. I don't issue motions. I issue orders. These are orders in limine and have been ordered since before this trial started. Is Your Honor ordering me not to explore the nature of the wrong? That is very broad. <laughs> the character of the conduct involved. You may not elicit testimony designed to leave the jury with the impression that Mr. Jones and the Free Speech Systems did not defame Mr. Heslin, or that Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems did not engage in the intentional infliction of emotional distress against Ms. Lewis and Mr. Heslin. May I elicit evidence as to the low degree of culpability that should be ascribed to Free Speech Systems and to Alex Jones by virtue of his education, his situation, the situation of info wars, uh, and what was going on. So Mr. Jones was too ignorant to know that he was lying? Is that your defense? Your Honor, my defense is for the jury, not for the court. Uh, I'm asking whether I can elicit testimony as to uh, his mental state, to the organization of the company, to the standard practices in his industry, um, to uh, what was going on in his personal life, um, all to illustrate the low degree of culpability that should be attributed to this woman. You can ask Mr. Jones questions about, similar to some of the questions or all the questions that were allowed um, when Ms. Karpova was on the stand, that kind of touch on these same areas that were allowed. I think those are fair game. Um, you can ask him. I mean, I think the answer is yes, as long as you're very careful. Very well. Anything else from you, Mr. Reynolds? No. Anything else from you, uh, Mr. Mayor? The only thing is I wanted to confirm to you that, that we'll be, tomorrow morning we'll be taking up whether there will be instructions and should I propose instructions to the board? Yes, please propose the exact instruction you would like me to give. I think it would be appropriate to give those instructions, if any, before Mr. Jones <coughs> retakes the stand. Um, yeah. One second, please. I think... We need something. We need some instruction. So you can do it the way you did the proposed charge instructions. You can both send my office an email if you would like to. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Jones would like to say something that's directly relevant to what we've been discussing. I, I am not. Very briefly, Your Honor. I think it's important for, for my I, candor towards the court that you I, hear what he has to say. I, I, I am not typically in the practice <coughs> of hearing from parties except when they are on the stand. And I don't see a reason to change that practice any more than I already have. I would, this is simply in line with your honor's question as to what he was instructed in terms of what he should testify about. It doesn't matter at this stage. I expect that you will go over the instructions as you are required to do under the rules. And I'm gonna leave it there. Anything else? Nothing else from either of you attorneys. Oh. Well, let's do a time check. Uh, we're certainly going longer than I think we have all sort of hoped. Mr. Reynal, you've used 10 hours and 33 minutes. The, uh, and today it's 
very inflated because all the breaks I just attributed to extra. So it looks like we've worked, <coughs> well, we have worked, but it's more than five and a half hours for today. So the sort of extra category is seven hours and six minutes. Um, and Mr. Bankston, for your side, it's 17 hours and 40 minutes. So I haven't done the, let me hang on one second. Let me figure one thing out. Yeah, so today it, it's all out of whack because it's uh, well over six hours, and I don't calculate, I calculated five and a half a day. Anyway, I think we're, we're okay. Um, I'm going to say that we need to conclude. I, I think we will run into a problem and run out of time, potentially, um, if we go past the lunch hour with evidence. Do you have a witness once Mr. Jones is finished? Mr. Jones is already finished. Okay. So hopefully we can get that um, in here. Anything else on the record? No, no. Let's go off the record. <coughs> Anything else at all? We've gone over, witness can only be Mr. Jones. We've gone over hours. Is there anything else? Will we be arguing tomorrow afternoon? Yes, yes. We will um, do our formal charge conference as soon as Mr. Jones's questions from the jury are concluded. And then depending on breaks, and all of that, we're going to start. We're going to start. All right. Anything else? <coughs> all right. One, one thing, Your Honor. Oh, would you, there is something else. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking, would you, assuming everything goes just swimmingly and as fast as it can tomorrow, which is hard to say to do, um, would you expect us to go into the punitive portion should the jury turn in verdict very quickly? Uh, so the problem is, you know, I have to read the entire jury charge out loud. And then I also have to read, I think it's a page, let me see real quick. It's hard for me to believe that would happen. I just wanted to make Yeah, sure. I don't think it will either. I read a page of other instructions and then I read the entire charge out loud, which it's not that long. Um, I mean, we have finalized it, but it's only 11 pages. And as you attorneys know, one of those pages is super, so it's not that bad, but I still think that's 15 minutes. Um, then when they go back, they don't have any evidence because we have to review it on the record. And then it goes back. So I find it unlikely. How would Your Honor like what evidence we do have to be on a, on a thumb drive? How, how do we do that? So. To date, the only exhibits you've admitted are paper. Then no, there's a video. It's been admitted? It has. And I, I think it's exhibit 67. It was admitted it's without objection. And has it been played to, play to the jury? It has. It's the Father's Day message. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. OK, so so far, what I have from you is 67. That's it, right? Um, where Where is it? Because once it's admitted, it's supposed to be up here with my court order. It's in your honor's computer. Courtroom computer. Oh, in that one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to need, and I'll be honest, I actually don't know what the system back there is. Oh, you know what? It's going to be the exact same system as this because they're deliberating in a neighboring courtroom. So I will need a thumb drive or something similar that contains only only admitted exhibits admitted to the jury and nothing else. Are you guys listening? Yes, yes sir. Sure. Okay. Because the same thing goes for you. So <coughs> if you had something that's a court exhibit, that's fine. You can give that to me separately. Um, we have a few, but the videos are only the ones that are admitted in their admitted form, which for the plaintiff includes the full video and the clips, does not include the deposition videos. Make sure those are not on there. Okay. I understand that. Okay. And this, Your Honor, is PX32 that I uh, moved into evidence today. Great. And leave it up here for Ms. Dubois. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All rise.